everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us today. We're really happy to talk about an unbuilt work. And um, so I am Elspeth Lee, and this is Don Hallahan. Together we run a practice called Superposition. Yeah, so as Elle says, today we're going to share with you a project that we've been working on um, for a number of years now. Uh, and this is, and um, which is currently in a planning stage. Um, and this is a project which is a community led project, community based project located uh, on the west coast of Ireland. Um, and it's a project which is very close, I guess, to our, um, our hearts and our, and our sort of intellectual sort of position as architects. And uh, we um, are going to first maybe situate that discussion in, um, and tell, us, t tell you guys a little bit about who we are as architects and a little bit about the work that we do. And then maybe some of the background of the project before we get into discussing the, the project itself. So we began working together after we finished at UCD in 2012-2013 um, and we are currently based between Hong Kong and Ireland, uh, Hong Kong where we're teaching and Ireland where our families are and where the majority of our projects actually are at the moment. Um, yeah, so our work, um, our practice is very much a research-led, research-based project. Um, we work uh, sort of between the sort of poles of teaching and research um, and, and practice. Um, our projects are generally always self-initiated or initiated with community. They're bottom-up projects and they're very much focused on um, material culture, building culture, how things are made, not only why they're made, I, I guess. Um, a lot of our work over the last, uh, recently has been situated in, in one village in, in rural China. Uh, where we've been working with a particular community to sort of to create a new development strategy for you know uh, updating or rebuilding uh, in the face of a sort of a new pressure of, of regional rural tourism um, and you know uh, we've never worked with <laughs> um, uh, big budgets or on uh, big commissions but I think where we see the impact of our work is in, in changing sort of a uh, culture of making and challenging uh, generic models um, of, of building and generic ways of, of living, I guess, and social, different types of social structures around uh, architecture some, as much as, as how they are constructed. So we've been interested in the countryside for um, quite a few years. So in non-urban sites and the productive landscape and the ecology. And what we're particularly interested in in Ireland is the reduction in complexity of the built forms and um, the rise of the generic, the mass manufactured, the, the bungalow bliss, the single house on several acres of land or on a half an acre of land surrounded by hardcore, front door facing the road, mm -hmm. back door directly behind. Um, and that's extremely typical in Ireland now and particularly in the location that this project is situated in West Clare where the dormer bungalow is, is really king. Um, and I think that, you know, we've, we've been reading a lot about um, the history of development in Ireland and how this is considered to be the, the vernacular or the pseudo vernacular, whereas mm -hmm. in pre-famine times, there would have been um, much more variety in terms of the way space, the way place would have been made. Um, and the way in which society organized itself or, or divided land and, and worked and shared resources. Mm. I think we use the term um, pseudo-normative a lot. Like today, the sort of traditional, uh, inverted commas, uh, development of the single family home in the countryside with the front and back garden um, is sort of the orthodox, whereas historically that's not the case. Um, Ireland had a, a very interesting and diverse set and range of both vernacular typologies, but also ways of inhabiting and living and sharing um, the productive landscape. So um, what we wanted to do is sort of, we've always been interested in that, I think, as architects and how to sort of uh, engage in uh, the non-urban non -urban sites in a, in a new way, in a meaningful way. So what we're looking at in terms of the one-off house in Ireland as well is, is the demand that that places on infrastructure, on car usage, on and on systems all leading towards one single family house and comparing that with the traditional developments um, such as this is a map of a clock on village before consolidation, so pre-famine and then after consolidation. And um, what you can see is the, 
each field is rep or each owner is represented by a different pattern and the land was distributed not equally but rather equitably where there was an equal division of good land and bad land and the community structure was was centered in the heart of that productive landscape and then post consolidation what you start to see emerging are the development patterns that we're more familiar with in rural Ireland where you have one single house surrounded by several acres of, of field. Um, and what Els is touching on here I think it is important has always been important to us as we because we're um, I'm from the west of Ireland and driving through the countryside is this can be um, you can see all of these it's sort of the apparent nature of this sort of condition and how actually servicing those one-off houses um, providing infrastructure roads sewage water electricity uh, costs county councils huge amounts of, uh, of money and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge investment of energy um, to provide for these very sort of inefficient modes of living, right, Where, which don't have sort of any community there, um, you know, they, there's no possibility to share sort of um, uh, programs like schools, or, you, know, you know, everything is far away and has to be networked or driven to. Um, and there's sort of, it's a very reductive or simpl simplified way of life where you know, previously it's a much more sophisticated system of ownership and collaboration and engagement with each other. And, you know, the, what we're trying to think about or what we have been thinking about for a long time is how to sort of reconcile this idea of private ownership and identity um, and the single family house and, and the sort of nuclear family and reconcile that with um, more sort of um, innovative models of living, of co-housing, of sharing um, and to sort of allay the fears and progress forward in a sort of way which responds to the sort of sustainability um, crisis that we're facing, I think, as a, as a culture in Ireland. So I guess thinking not only about the ways in which these spaces are organized and, and built and the environmental and social co consequences of that, but also thinking about how the buildings are made. So, you know, with the with the concrete block and nap render, there is um, a vernacular intelligence that is lost or has been lost? Mm. I think in Ireland we're sort of very much a post uh, craft society in some ways and how we realize our structures you know and um, previously there was this um, you know before I guess this sort of modernization or industrialization of the building industry um, we had a much more diverse and sort of uh, set of crafts around house building and cultures around house building how we made our structures um, and there was an intelligence in that and a specificity to site and place and I think we've lost in the generic um, concrete block and steel frame construction systems that we're using um, and again that's something that's always interested us is how do we challenge this sort of generic and what can we can we take some of that intelligence um, that existed um, you know in turn not only in terms of material but in terms of a building siting its aspect its, its, its location um, uh, within a region or area and then also pair that with advances in sort of uh, modern technology and, and building technology. So one reason that we're looking at the, this is known as the deserted village on Slivmore in Ackle, um, is that it bears some resemblance in terms of site to the project that we're looking at where we have um, a sloped site overlooking the sea and thinking about the way in which the, the building is designed specifically for that. So I think what we, what we find with a lot of the, the concrete block buildings nowadays is that they're not, very, um, they're not very considered in how they approach the, the elements or how they approach the site or how they approach the context. Mm -hmm. um, and, and looking at both the siting of this village and also the communality of it and the materiality of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's interesting. I think the, uh, for us anyway, this idea that, um, you know, with the advances, with the benefits of, of sort of modern construction, the generic construction and that its ability to sort of um, provide a, um, you know, people with a better quality of life, um, we've lost something else in, in how we think and tackle um, the issues. And what we're trying to, what we've been trying to do for a long time is reconcile those, those two poles. And um, I guess this project that we're going to discuss now is, is, our, is our first attempt to do that. Um, but we've always felt, I think, um, that these sort of changes or transformations to the how we think of non-urban architecture in Ireland and rural Ireland, um, how, we, how we approach that would not be a top-down effort. It would not be something that would be led by uh, county councils or enforced um, through sort of legislation. Instead, it would have to come from 
and the communities of people themselves who are willing to give up um, sort of certain things or to gain others. Um, and we very luckily, I think, um, in our sort of travels around Ireland and our discussions that we were having with craftspeople and with uh, makers, we, we were lucky to come across um, Sally and Fergal uh, Smith. So Sally and Fergal, they run a, a farm in close to La Hinch in West Clare called Moyhill Farm. And it's a CSA farm. And what that means is that it's a collective um, community supported agriculture. And what that means is that at the start of the season, the community together with the farm take a risk on a bad growing season, but also reap the benefits of a good growing season. So you commit to um, helping that farmer to grow the crops. So the, the risk is essentially shared among the community. But what's particularly interesting about Fergal and Sally's story is that Fergal uh, is a pro surfer and he became quite disillusioned with the lifestyle of global travel and, and wave searching. And um, they decided to settle down on the west of Ireland and return to the land. So what they started by doing was creating a community garden, which was one acre of land that was loaned to them by a member of the community, through which they started feeding families, uh, inviting children, schools to come down and engage with the, the process of growing. And from that one acre, they then um, purchased 17 acres. And then uh, 60 acres surrounding that patch of land were due to be planted with monoculture Sitka spruce. So what they managed to do was to crowdfund enough money to purchase that land outright, replant it with native Irish woodlands and hold it in a trust mm. um, for the local community or for the, for the Irish landscape, I suppose. Yeah. And I think that the, these um, Fergal and, and Sally, um, uh, Fergal's father and um, was also a farmer, I think, and then he sort of was tapping into his his roots and, and thinking about how to sort of be a, uh, I guess, a, a, someone who makes a change, like actually practically uh, gets involved with the transformation of, of the landscape um, and it's sort of re, uh, repurposing or reinvigorating, I guess, um, or, or I guess this is land that's just been sort of neglected and abandoned for a long time. Uh, but, you know, they're really interested in community. What, while they want to live there and be part of the landscape which they're building or, or uh, rejuvenating, they also don't want to do that alone. They, they're fundamentally people, people, people. <laughs> and they, uh, they want to be with a group of people who, who also uh, want to do that. They, they feel that the social structures are equally as important as the physical ones that they're, they're building on the landscape. And they're trying to sort of find a way to make this infrastructure, which is, will support a community um, through creating a livelihood at the farm, um, but then also to develop all those social sort of structures and supports, um, child support, for example, or education, um, you know, other activities around that sort of um, that lifestyle. So to build a lifestyle. And what we, we think about this is a sort of the urbanization of the rural in some ways, like how can we make this um, space more attractive for people um, to sort of come back to in some ways. So essentially the end goal for us and um, together with Sally and Fergal, who we've been working with for a couple of years now on this, is to strategize a means of achieving this with the, the end goal being that of a co-housing um, in rural Ireland. Yeah, which were a number of families would come together to share um, housing, but also a livelihood. And um, so the proposal that we're going to show today is um, the first step in, in this process, which we really feel will probably be quite a lengthy process and mm. that's, that's fine. Um, but this is the, uh, the central point of the farm, which is a, um, a teaching space, a community space, essentially a, a central node for that farm where uh, work, community events, teaching all take place. Yeah, so essentially what we're, we're trying to build here is, or is, build or is to make is, is, is a place. And what we're designing at this stage is, is the farm building, the first um, real structure on, on the farm, which will sort of provide um, space and also formalize um, the activities of that space to give it a sort of a, a central focus, a place uh, in the landscape uh, with which to grow out from. 
So just to talk a little bit about the site, so um, you can see La Hinch Beach in the in the distance. This is a photograph taken from the site and it's um, the views are amazing. The land is marginal and it is kind of an unusual selection for a site in that it is a north facing slope uh, with prevailing winds from both onshore and from the southeast. Um, it's quite marshy and um, there's not really much planting on the on the land so far. Mm -hmm. Um, just some more views. This is the showing the slope so and this, showing the view. This is the site we have chosen or together, I think, as 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 the location for this new building. Um, as Elsa says, it's a north facing slope, which looks out towards the Atlantic. Uh, so amazing views to the north. Um, but um, you know, it's 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 a challenging site. Uh, as Elsa says, the wind profile. You both have you know southwesterly sort of strong winds as usual in Ireland, but you also have these strong gales coming in from the sea, uh, onshore and offshore. Um, so. Yeah, we uh, hope we, this is this is where hopefully we will be placing our our new farm center building. So the the main thing that we were trying to address with with our initial proposal for the design was to think about the view, think about strategies for passive daylight, and also to think about how we can fit all of the requirements for the brief into um, a fairly small envelope with a very tight budget. So thinking about how perhaps we could propose something that could be um, built incrementally, uh, depending on when funds will be available, depending on when work would be available. So the, the first move was to make a huge roof. Um, and the idea behind that roof was that it could be expanded to the east, but also that it could be infilled and finished as and when funds were available. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the all under one roof is the big idea, I think, and providing a sort of an infrastructural support and a system which can grow uh, both outward and can be subdivided and, and reprogrammed as and when the, the, it, that, that is needed or that's important. Um, so you can see maybe here in the, in the elevation of drawings of the building where we have, this is the north facing facade and we can imagine filling and infilling that space underneath the roof as, as I said as things change along the farm um, and we have functions which are both outside and functions which are contained so we have inside and outside spaces um, again developed as and when as appropriate um, so our site strategy is is relatively straightforward um, we are opening up to the south and um, protecting um, to the north, uh, protecting from the winds, while still allowing sort of views in and out, uh, views out towards the sort of uh, the north to the sea. Um, there's a, so environmentally, we have a double skin facade, which we chose both for its performance and as a sort of a space which could be programmed, could be used for growing or as a sort of um, greenhouse space or breakout spaces for, for the community. Um, the sort of the double height clear story windows allows a lot of light to be brought in both in the north and uh, from sorry in the winter and in the summer sun uh, with a thermal mass uh, with a sort of a material uh, rammed earth thermal mass to sort of uh, contain and some of that heat and trap it uh, during the sort of colder times. So this is just showing a section through through that roof and um, cross section and the long section. Um, so it's designed as a series of portal frames um, and essentially split into two roofs. So the first half of the roof we imagine will be built first and then that can operate as essentially a, a workshop in which the remainder of the structure can be built. Um, and the roof remains flat for half of the structure and then we've brought it up uh, in, in kind of one single move which is centered around the hearth and what that does is, is pull it up from the realm of the domestic to the realm of the public. And this is the space in which we kind of envision the majority of community events or, or gatherings taking place. And um, so providing both the height and the, the kind of warmth of the hearth, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that how that sort of begins to sort of express itself on, on the different faces of the building. Um, you know, sort of, it, it sort of shows itself. You, you can see it embedded in the landscape uh, on the south and then open to the north, but it's also protected by a sort of uh, overhanging ease. 
and the overhanging eaves are sort of designed in a way to um, around the circulation in a way to sort of we're using the sort of ex external sort of um, north face of the building in some ways as, as, a, as a secondary circulation route so you would travel in and out of the building depending on where on what you're doing there and you're protected from the sort of rain and the wind under this eaves but then you're also confronted each time with the landscape and you look down over the sea and then as you move in um, the light changes the dynamics of the building changes and the, the sort of the, op the building opens up to the south above your head and the light kind of falls through the structure um, in designing the structure in, the, in its modularity, um, I think modularity is, the, is maybe the wrong word, as we're learning from the work that we've been doing in other spaces and other rural places. And this idea that um, what we're doing is not creating a generic system or a modular system, but creating a system of construction or designing a system of construction which is simple, straightforward, um, but can be adapted to the specific nature of a site. Um, so it's a challenge to the orthodox way of construction and, and sort of the idea of the standardized unit or the, you know, the, the modular construction system. And instead, what we're doing is designing a series of tools and systems which enables unskilled workers to develop these complex structures simply. And again, this references our earlier work in, in, in other areas. Um, and what we're trying to do there is just change the paradigm. We want to show that we can still create um, you know, we can or we can create these sort of very specific structures tailored to a, con, uh, a need of a community and a site and realize them in, in, in an efficient uh, way, which sort of reduces a lot of the onerous labor involved in construction. Um, I can do that in a sustainable sort of way and with materials which are, you know, um, maybe a little bit less uh, predictable in, in how they, they sort of manifest themselves in the construction. Um, so this is just an, an interior shot of that double height space. So maybe it's also a good time to talk about in terms of material that, um, you know, this, this project is being uh, constructed on an extremely tight budget. So we're trying with that to try and make a, a space that is not necessarily ordinary. Um, and with that, also thinking about sustainability and materiality. So how can we, how can we construct something from what is available locally, and also what, like what modules can be easily handled by um, volunteers or by volunteer mm -hmm. labor. So looking at small timber sections, looking at uh, cob or rammed earth walls, and um, looking at stone, dry stone walling, and thinking always about what the experience is like of being inside this place, and can you make something, you know, extraordinary out of ordinary? Yeah, and it's more that. Um, you know, this image sort of also, it was a quick sketch that was early in the design process, but I think it shows the major features, you know, this sort of transforming roof, um, which goes from something which is sort of uh, repetitious to something which is individual and unique, um, a tent-like structure which moves above the hearth, and it creates this non-domestic space, this community space where you can gather around. Um, and, you know, we imagine this space um, being used for sort of uh, teaching and learning and for sharing, um, you know, uh, Fergal and Sally often organize concerts and small gatherings in order, order to build community. And we imagine this is a space for doing that. And again, showing just how we overlook the landscape and yeah, and we benefit, we bring the light in from above, uh, we filter it and we use the sort of the site to its best advantage, capitalize on, on what we can and, and thinking again about um, not only what we're making, but how we're making it, you know, it's this challenge to the generic, this challenge to um, sort of ideas of sustainability, um, which for us fundamentally start with a social question, an idea of community, and then how do we create a structure which embodies all of those elements. So this project is really the first step in what we see as being a much longer scheme or a much longer scale project. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're throughout that process, there's been shifts in the community. Um, but what we're hoping that this building can help to achieve is, is um, a kind of a, a locus or a sort of a, a center point that from which this community can grow and can develop. And that it can also become um, a model for rural living, which could legitimize co-housing in a rural setting or mm -hmm. And like we, we firmly believe that architecture has that role. Um, 
you know, these collect these community structures um, through being formalized through a building like this, uh, as El says, I think develop a legitimacy and can act as a case study and, you know, a, a way in which other areas can potentially develop. And that's really our interest in changing a sort of a paradigm of, of rural living and rural development. So I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for having us and take care. Thank you. Thank you.